All right, turn in your Bibles to John chapter 10 this morning. John chapter 10 for a message I've entitled The Good Shepherd. John 10 and The Good Shepherd. A lot of folks will ask me, why do you, why do you sing that song, Reckless Love of God? And God's not reckless. Yes, God is not reckless. And yet at the same time, God often uses through His Scripture and in other places what we would call anthropomorphic language to describe His character and His attributes. Anthro-man-centered language to help us understand who God is. God will say in the Scriptures that He wrote on the tablets with His finger. We know that God doesn't have a finger He's using that language, that imagery, to try to help us understand who He is and how intimately He was connected with the writing of His Word. So when we talk about the reckless love of God, it's not that God is reckless, it's that we would understand what reckless is. In other words, God is going to run through whatever wall of sin you have constructed in your life to find you. That's not who he is, but that would help us understand a little bit about how far he's going to go to pursue you. And as we talk about the Good Shepherd this morning, he does leave the 99 to come find the one. Okay? And so I'm happy that God lights up every dark place in my life. He doesn't give me any, any place to hide. I'm happy that he does that. I'm happy that he comes and finds me when I try to construct walls to keep him out. God is good, and His love is good. And so we're going to read about the Good Shepherd this morning. Let me ask you this question. Has anyone ever worked for or played for a bad leader? Raise your hands. May have found, followed a bad leader? Worked for one? Played for one? Maybe if they were your coach? I'm sure I've been that guy in the past. I'm sure I've been the bad leader. Um, I pray that by God's grace and lessons learned, the hard way, I'm not that guy now. I'm still very much a work in progress. But working under bad leadership is toxic. It's like kryptonite. It's like walking out into North Carolina humidity. Stifling, right? It takes the starch right out of you, working under a bad leader. Every Marine officer goes through what's called the basic school. No matter what your commissioning source was, whether you came from a ROTC program or whether you came from OCS, Officer Candidate School, or whether you came from the Naval Academy, no matter what your commissioning source was, you all end up at the basic school. Uh, whether you're an air contract, a, a ground contract, or a lawyer, you all have to go through the basic school, which is a six-month school that's designed to teach every Marine officer how to be a provisional infantry platoon commander. So you may go off and, and be a JAG attorney and, and you may, you know, defend, uh, you know, Colonel uh, Jessup one day, right? You may be that guy, but you're going to go learn how to be a rifle platoon commander before you become a lawyer. So the idea here is that it's a, it's a, it's a baseline place to learn how to command troops. Now, one of the ways that they do this is they put people in positions of responsibility, and oftentimes what they'll do is they'll take what they perceive to be the weakest leaders and they'll elevate them to be the company commanders, the company first sergeants. They'll give them these elevated positions because they see some cracks in their armor and they're going to weed those guys out. So they put them in these higher uh, echelons of leadership within student leadership. And you have peer evaluations, all of this that goes into it. So these guys, oftentimes, if they have any chinks in their armor, when you put them in these elevated capacities of leadership, it shows. And so oftentimes they're weeded out. There's a second aspect to this too. It forces everybody else to be under them. And you have to follow bad leaders. It gives you a taste of what it's like to have to follow somebody terrible. So that one day, when you're the leader, you won't do that again. And so there's as much learning by comes from being just a rifleman underneath a bad leader um, as there is in being in those elevated positions. But we've all been in those positions before. Nobody wants to follow a bad leader. It's painful. 
the text today isn't a thesis on how to be a good leader, though you can garner some leadership uh, characteristics from the text. The text simply answers this question, who should we follow? Who should we follow? Who should we follow when the world is crying out for our attention? When marketing campaigns appeal to our felt needs? When the news media arouses our basic instincts, who should we follow when the whole world is clamoring for our attention? Jesus answers this question by telling something of a parabolic story here in chapter 10. So read with me these first six verses. Truly, I tell you, anyone who doesn't enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in some other way, is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens it for him, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought all his own outside, he goes ahead of them. The sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will never follow a stranger. Instead, they will run away from him because they don't know the voice of strangers. And Jesus gave them this figure of speech, but they didn't understand what he was telling them. Jesus is using... A figure of speech. In other words, the figures presented here in the story aren't real. They're simply figures. But they do represent real things and real people. This issue of biblical interpretation is huge. Um, so many people love the Bible and they don't know the Bible. And one of the things that we have to get right is how do we read the Bible? How do we understand it? How do we interpret it? Uh, this question of what we would call hermeneutics, which is the field of study of interpretation. And so beginning in our life groups on the 20th, we're going to begin a, a book study on the 40 questions about interpreting the Bible. And we'll work through a couple of those questions every week, but it's going to help us understand and ask the right questions as we come to a particular text. So when we say that the Bible is inspired when we say that the Bible is the inerrant word of God, we are not discounting the humanity of its authorship or general grammatical conventions. To say that we interpret the Bible literally is to say that we interpret the Bible normally, meaning the normal rules of speech are employed. The Bible employs about 20 to 30 different kinds of figures of speech. Dr. Jimmy Draper points out in his book, Biblical Authority, it is just as destructive to take a figurative passage literally as it is to take a literal passage figuratively. When I say your nose is running, it should be clear to you that your nose isn't lacing up his Nikes to go run down the street, right? It's a figure of speech. Jesus, more than anyone, employs figures of speech, including in the text today. So the figures presented here are the sheep pen, the gate, the gatekeeper, the thief, the shepherd, the sheep, and the stranger. But as is often the case, people that Jesus is speaking to, they don't understand. They had a certain vision for how the Messiah was supposed to look, and Jesus didn't fit that mold. They so tunnel visioned about what it should be that they couldn't see what actually was. But Jesus is long suffering, right? He continues bearing with them. He offers them an explanation here of the characters in the story. In verse 7, he says this Truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep didn't listen to them. I am the gate. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. A thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come so that they may have life and have it in abundance. In this story, Jesus is represented by a couple of figures. He is first represented by the figure of the gate. He says, I am the gate. This is the third of his seven I am statements in the book of John. The gate for the sheep. The gate rep represents a mechanism for entry. Gaining entry, as Jesus mentions in verse 9, includes access to both sustenance and salvation. 
The sheep will be provided for in the pasture and they'll be saved from predators by the protection of the pen. But the gate doesn't just serve as a mechanism for entry. It also reminds us that some are excluded from entry. The sheep pen is a restricted area. It's a private courtyard. It's a family's home. It has walls. It's open to the sky, but not to the public. There is only one point of entry. In verse 1, he mentions that those who attempt to climb in and over those walls are thieves. And even though there is only one way in, they try to gain access another way. Those people aren't sheep. They're thieves and robbers. And their aim is to steal, kill, and destroy. But the aim of Jesus is to give life and quality of life. Life in abundance. Jesus isn't just the gate, though. He's also represented by another figure in this story. Look with me in verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand, since he is not the shepherd and doesn't own the sheep, leaves them and runs away when he sees a wolf coming. The wolf then snatches and scatters them. This happens because he is a hired hand and he doesn't care about the sheep. He says, I am the good shepherd. Again, the fourth of the seven I am statements. So we have to ask this question. How is it that Jesus is both the gate and the shepherd? The gate is an inanimate object. The shepherd is clearly animate. So how can Jesus, at one time, in human form, be both? The same way he is both God and man. This is not some accidental mixing of metaphors by Jesus. It's a living illustration. Jesus declares himself to be the good shepherd, which automatically means that there are bad shepherds. And in case, and just in case, in this case, he describes them as hired hands. These hired hands don't have any pride in ownership. After all, they're someone else's sheep. If they see anything difficult like a wolf, they just run away. And the end result is that the sheep are snatched and scattered. And all of this is a product of the fact that he didn't care. But in contrast to the hired hand who doesn't care, Jesus does care. In fact, he cares so much that he lays down his life for the sheep. Of course, that's obvious as we fast forward a few chapters here and we get to the cross. But even before the cross, Jesus was laying down his life for the sheep. After all, he left the throne room of heaven to come down and dwell amongst us. Jesus' entire earthly existence is evidence of what it looks that like to lay down your life so jesus has compared himself to other shepherds but now he compares his sheep to other sheep in verse 14 he says i am the good shepherd i know my own and my own know me just as the father knows me and i know the father i lay down my life for the sheep but i have other sheep that are not from this sheep pen. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. Then there will be one flock, one shepherd. This is why the Father loves me, because I lay down my life so that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own. I have the right to lay it down, and I have the right to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father. Once again, Jesus leads with his identity as the good shepherd, but rather than compare himself to the bad shepherds, now he's comparing his sheep to the other sheep. It's clear that Jesus knows who are his, and those who are his know him. And there's a mutual understanding between Jesus and the sheep. It mirrors the Father and the Son. There is unity between the shepherd and the sheep, but there's also distinction. Calvin says, it's as if he said that there's no it is no more possible for him to be oblivious of us than for the Father to reject or neglect him. Unity and distinction, just like the Trinity. The Good Shepherd is deeply Trinitarian. Once again, Jesus reminds them that the Good Shepherd lays down his life for the sheep, but while the sheep only have one shepherd, the shepherd has more than one sheep pen, and he must bring them also. And not only do the sheep follow the shepherd, but they respond to his voice. The sheep are not only aware of his presence, but they listen to his voice. A call from the shepherd moves the sheep toward him. And after all, 
After all the sheep from all the pens have been gathered, there will be one flock with one shepherd. And the sacrificial, life-giving love of the shepherd garners the love of the Father. And Jesus reminds them that the giving of His life is exactly that. It's a gift. It's a gift. No one takes His life. Not Jewish authorities. Not Pontius Pilate. Jesus laid it down. And Jesus picks it back up again. The cross and the resurrection were both Jesus' decision and His sacrifice to offer. And every time Jesus preaches, it causes a stir, right? It causes division. In verse 19, it says, And the Jews were divided because of the crowds. Many of them were saying, He has a demon, and He's crazy. Why do you listen to Him? Others were saying, These aren't the words of someone who is demon-possessed. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? Jesus is access, protection, and provision. That's our main idea this morning. Jesus is access, He is protection, and He is provision. Cancel culture existed in the first century. You see that? He must have a demon. I mean, that's exactly how they're portraying this story. Isn't it often the case when people don't understand something, they simply try to just dismiss it? Sometimes the the way to dismiss it is to say, that person must be crazy. They must be demon-possessed. In other words, if it's outside the bounds of what we understand, it must be lunacy. As if what we understand represents the limits of understanding. But while some are given to be dismissive, Some are still applying a logic here and exercising reason. And their argument is simple. Only one who is God-possessed, not demon-possessed, can open the eyes of the blind. That's their argument. And why would it be controversial for such a God-possessed man to claim a relationship with God? Or to be God? When it says in verse 6 that they didn't understand, it wasn't because Jesus wasn't clear. It's because they didn't want to hear. The distinction between those who are His and those who are not has nothing to do with the method of teaching that Jesus employed. This is the last message of Jesus to the public at large. He establishes Himself as the judge in chapter 8. We've heard from an eyewitness in chapter 9. And now once again, Jesus articulates who He is to anybody who's in earshot. In contrast to the terrible shepherding by the blind man's parents, to the terrible shepherding by the religious authorities, Jesus presents himself as the ideal caretaker and role model, i.e. the good shepherd here. Jesus is access, protection, and provision. Gives us a lot to think about by way of application here. And so first and foremost, let's be sure to, number one, enter by the gate. Enter by the gate. We can talk about God generically. We can even talk about spirituality with our neighbors. We can even declare Christ and His crucifixion. But when we declare that Christ is the only gate to get into heaven, then we're going to find ourselves in hot water. That's when the message becomes offensive. Because the church's job is not to talk about a generic God, but a God who is made known in the person and work of Jesus Christ. You have to really hate your neighbors to not tell them they're going to hell. You have to really hate your neighbors to not tell them that Jesus loves them. In contrast to the slaughter, our call is that they would be saved. In verse 17, Jesus says, This is why the Father loves me, because I am fulfilling the role as shepherd, laying down my life for the sheep, one Davidic shepherd over one dependent flock. That's Jesus. The shepherd lays down his life for the sheep, not out of necessity, but out of love. Out of love for God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever would believe in Him would not perish, but have everlasting life. He doesn't do it out of necessity. He does it out of love. You see, the cross is both an instrument of death and an instrument of love, all at the same time. We enter by the gate, number one. Secondly, we follow His voice. Follow His voice. The sheep follow Him because they know His voice. Luke 23, 43 reminds us that Jesus offers paradise and not condemnation, right? He extends paradise to the thief on the cross. Following Jesus isn't just about punching your ticket into heaven, though. It's also about having a life and having a good life, having life in abundance and having it now. Jesus isn't just preserving life. He's giving life its meaning. He cares for his sheep. He provides for his sheep. He protects his sheep. In a world full of noise, 
Follow the voice of your shepherd. Follow his voice. Number three, run away from the stranger's voice. Run away from the stranger's voice. Verse five, it says this, the sheep do not know the voice of the stranger. The shepherd's sheep won't stay with the stranger. What drives the sheep away is not simply the command of the stranger, but his alien presence. Now I want you to think about this. People come at you, different ways to think about things, different worldviews, maybe even different religious ideas. It's not just the words that they're saying. You should be offended by their mere alien presence, the stranger's voice. Verse 20, it says, why listen to him? This is the comment that they made. He's got a demon. Why do you listen to him? And in that statement, they are revealing why they're not his. Because the sheep recognize and follow his voice, and these guys have no interest in his voice, revealing that they are not, in fact, his sheep. Their aim is to steal and destroy. When Jesus says in verse 8, All who came before me are thieves and robbers, he is establishing himself as the exclusive gate. Now, let me caveat this. Moses and the faithful Old Testament prophets weren't thieves and robbers. 2 Corinthians 3 reminds us that they shepherded toward the Messiah even though their vision was obscured. And yet, all of the shepherds who came before Christ, and parenthetically, all of the shepherds who come after Christ, are insufficient to be the Christ. They're insufficient. Whether they be the religious leaders of Jesus' day or the religious leaders of our day, if anyone tries to suggest another way into heaven, they are a thief and they are a robber. Run away from the stranger's voice. Run to Christ. Strangers are temporary. Christ is eternal. There are many of them. There is only one Jesus. Enter by the gate. Follow his voice. Run away from the stranger. And number four, choose the right gatekeeper. Choose the right gatekeeper. Find a lowercase s shepherd that leads you to the uppercase s shepherd. There are a lot of pastors out there who are just hired workers. They're self-motivated. They don't display loyalty. They don't cultivate friendships. And at the exact moment when they're needed, they fail to perform. And the reason is the sheep don't matter to them. The sheep are simply a means to an end. When you choose a church, you need to ask yourself the question, is this under-shepherd this pastor, going to point me to the good shepherd in Christ? Does this pastor care? Will this pastor fight off the wolf of bad teaching? I want you to take a look at this video real quick quick of a sheep kind of caught in a, a hole and a shepherd getting the sheep out. Yeah. I mean, if that doesn't speak to you, I mean, I, I'm laughing because it's so dumb. And then I realized that the metaphor is we're the sheep. Oh, my goodness. We're the sheep. Jesus trying to get us out of the hole. And we run right back in the hole. Every time. We're that dumb, aren't we? Praise be to God that he's that good, right? I mean, he's that good. I have so many people fall in love with the music, fall in love with the children's programming, and they compromise on the preaching and the pastor, and they ultimately leave themselves exposed to the wolf. And I am not sitting here saying I've got my act together. I'm a big fat mess. But I know who does. I know Christ. I'm going to do my best to point you to him every week. Okay, so just hear my heart there. Um, don't fall in love with all the trinkets of the church. Fall in love with the Word of God and hold fast to that. A good shepherd knows who are theirs. They lead their sheep in the direction they should go. They echo the voice of the chief shepherd. They walk along with their sheep. They remain with the sheep, directing them, not driving them. Shepherding is rooted in and springs from the cross. It's not just a, a willingness to lay down your life. It's the actual laying down of your life. Hear his call 
and recognize his voice. He has many pens, but he calls his sheep by name. Think about that for a minute. He has many pens, but he calls his sheep by name. There is a broad appeal to the cross. Christ has many sheep pens to the Jew first and to the Greek, to the rich and to the poor. The love of the cross beckons across generations, across ethnicities, across socioeconomic distinctions. The heart of God is that none should perish, no, not one. The shepherd has many sheep pens. You are one of many. And yet, despite the fact that you are one of many, God knows who are His. He calls them by name. You are known. You are loved. You are cared for. He knows your name. You are the recipients of God's grace just by being here today and by hearing His Word. Worshiping with His people. And those who have received His grace have a responsibility to heed His voice. Those who hear the voice must respond in faith, in hope, and in love. But most especially in love, because these are the greatest of these. I want you to listen to this version of Psalm 23. Because Jesus is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for Christ's name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for Christ is with me. His rod and His staff, they comfort me. He prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. He anoints my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all of the days of my life. And because of Christ, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. John 10 is the New Testament, Psalm 23. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for today. Thank you that even in our weakness, even in our stupidity, even though you drag us out of a hole and we climb right back in it, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his willingness to constantly come after us, to find us in our weakness and draw us back to Him. Thank You that we're not left on our own to walk through this world, but we have a good Savior. We have a good, good Father. So Lord, during this time of invitation, I would just, I would just pray that if there's someone who's never, never heeded Your voice, never owned it, never professed faith, never stepped out in obedience, God, I pray that you would accomplish that in their lives. And more than anything, God, I pray that we would walk out of here reminded that you're good. What you've done is good. We thank you for the work on the cross, but more importantly, you, the person of Christ, is good. Amen.